Good. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. You're welcome. Thank you. Sorry about that. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for taking time today to participate in this webinar. I um, am hopeful that there will be something for everybody in this. My specialty really is control of invasive plants, and so I'm I'm always trying to get that message in there. But I'll um, I've I've got that limited today, and as it perhaps is obvious, I struggle with uh, technology. So hopefully that will be our last blip today. So here we go. I'm Cheryl Colbreth, and I will be talking today um, about native plants for shady spots and. Uh, maybe just some other little tidbits of information that you'll find helpful. So I wanna thank the uh, Minnesota Horticultural Society for sponsoring this webinar. And uh, this is in uh, collaboration with the Minnesota Women's Woodland Network, which is an organization that's near and dear to me. I've been involved with them since 2009 and uh, just joined their board um, recently. So I'm on the board. And also at the bottom of the screen, you can see that um, I've put a link into the MinWin, as we call them for short. There's also a reference to MinWin on the resource page that has been posted um, for the seminar. So if any of you are interested, have questions, feel free to go to that site. Otherwise, you also can certainly contact me with questions. Uh, native plants are my specialty. The more I spend time in nature, the more I realize that native plants are such a critical aspect to our environment not um, not just for their beauty but they are critical to life itself and again i realize that more and more as i spend time in nature if you did not hear or attend the last webinar that i did on april 2nd with the horticultural society I would encourage you to go to the link in the resource document and listen to that. There are some critical pieces of information that I'm not going to duplicate here today that um, I, I think are just important for you to realize as you're choosing plants and going forth with your time and energy. Just a quick reference here, uh, Douglas Tallamy, this is his quote, Douglas Tallamy is really amazing to me. He's an author of some books that are, uh, that can change the landscape of our country if if we give him some time um, and read and reference his book. So he, what he says is what we plant in our landscapes determines what can live in our landscapes. By favoring productive species, or he's referencing native plants, we can create life. And by using non-native plants, we can prevent it. And I can't say it any better than that. I'm having trouble with the right buttons here. So just a quick review, native means that these are plants that are naturally occurring. Historically, they've always been here before, before we came along. Their genetics are not altered by humans. So in opposition to that, we would see cultivars or nativars where uh, somebody in a lab has taken and altered the genetics of that, that pure native. Once they're established, native plants are very low maintenance if they're planted in the appropriate habitat, soil conditions, sun conditions, et cetera. And they are not available at traditional retail outlets. So places like Menards, Bachmann's, et cetera, I, I certainly do shop there, but if I'm buying something from that location, it's maybe gonna go in my window box or it's gonna go in a pot. I am not gonna put it out in the wild because they're very rarely, well, first of all, they're probably not gonna be true pure natives and very likely they are some sort of a cultivar or a nativar that can potentially mess up the uh, genetics that we presently have. And I don't want that to happen. I've seen it happen way too often. Uh, it's, gosh darn it, I keep hitting the wrong button there. Um, so anyway, we'll move on. I'll uh, get off that topic and try to stay on the right buttons here. So native ground cover plants, I'm thinking native ground cover, not just, not just plants that will grow in a woodland, but this part of my presentation is gonna focus on ground cover plants. When we have bare soil in our woodlands, that's when we're asking for trouble from invasive plants like buckthorn or garlic mustard. And some of that nasty stuff will, 
will set up shop so easily where we have exposed or disturbed soil in our woodlands. And historically, we would have a four to six inch duff layer. So that would be organic material like leaves and twigs. And if that were present as it should be, we really wouldn't have much of an issue with our uh, invasive plants like the buckthorn and garlic mustard. But we have invasive earthworms in our woodlands now, and they do a fabulous job of chewing and mulching the leaves and the organic debris, which leaves us with exposed soil. So one of the things to keep in mind is how are we going to cover that exposed soil? And one way is with a plant, a native plant like Virginia waterleaf. If I could only pick for our area uh, one plant that I could have in my woodland, it would be Virginia waterleaf. The leaves are beautiful. Uh, waterleaf uh, is its common name because you can see that the leaves look like they're spotted, like water dropped on them. Uh, they have a gorgeous flower. They're blooming right now. They are so easy to transplant just about any time of year. And they are not um, going to block out other plants. So they, they play nicely in the sandbox, if you will. Uh, so number one, this would be my recommendation. And one of the things that I've started to realize in my journey having started with a garden club in Minnetonka where we probably planted every invasive plant that was, was available uh, and didn't realize that we were doing something harmful, um, is that I find beauty to be different now where the showy things, those uh, flashy flowers are what I used to think was attractive. And now um, I'm really not seeing that anymore. Now what I'm seeing is that things like Virginia water leaf, things that historically belong here are much more beautiful to me. Wood violets are another species that will create a fabulous ground cover. They're durable. Uh, we're in shady areas, so you're going to see a nice spread, but it's not going to take over. Again, they're not going to interrupt the other diversity of native species that should be in a woodland, but they certainly provide some beautiful color. As far as a vine, Virginia creeper can be a vine that grows up the tree. This was uh, a, a dead tree stump in my Minnetonka yard where I used to live. And um, uh, it could also grow over a fence. The, the color goes from the beautiful green that's going on this time of year and turns that deep crimson in the fall. The, the plant is palmate or has, like your palm, five leaves. And frequently people think that this is poison ivy. And I will have a picture of poison ivy towards the end of the presentation, but poison ivy has three leaves. So Virginia creeper, five leaves. There are two different species of Virginia creeper. Uh, there's a Virginia creeper itself and woodbine. They're so similar that we rarely differentiate. Uh, this would be the, the uh, woodbine. So you can see that the two top leaves are slightly offset from the bottom three, as opposed to the photo at the right they uh, don't distinguish quite so much. The berries will feed the birds. Um, this plant does spread, but it is not harsh. So we have another native plant, Vitus riparia or wild grape. That um, stem on that vine can get to be, I've seen it grow at least to six inches in diameter. It can take down mature trees, uh, or at least reasonably sized trees. This plant, this vine is not going to be that that uh, vibrant in terms of its growth ability, pretty gentle. If you have wet areas in your woodland, jewelweed is an awesome plant. Uh, it's going to flower a little bit later in the year, summer. Uh, the photo at the very left shows the little germinating uh, jewelweeds. They're, they're a bit of a succulent kind of a leaf, sort of thick and in fact, as the plant grows, people will say that uh, they use it for skin irritation. So it's like an aloe plant when you break those leaves open as it matures. And then to just to the very left plant is the germinating. Then the next one is uh, kind of a mid growth. And then the big picture with the flower is what it will look like at maturity. And in the little photo inset at the right, you can see a seed pod. 
The reason one of its names is touch me not is when that seed pod is at the stage I've shown in the photo, if you touch it, it bursts open and the seeds scatter. And it kind of is a tickling sort of feeling. So if you have young children, uh, see if you can find some of that later this summer and let them, let them uh, touch those and pop them open. Enchanter's nightshade is another great woodland native plant not very showy, but it certainly does provide food to certain species. It's a, another ground cover that is pretty prolific, but is not going to become uh, running over your other plants. It gets a bad rap because it's often confused with stick seed, also known as beggar's lice. And I'm listing the Latin names in parentheses too. If you do any research or you're looking plants up, I think your results will always be better if you use the Latin scientific botanical name. So what I can show you in this picture is that if you're looking at stick seed, by the way, it is native, but it's like poison ivy and some of the other native plants, not necessarily desirable for us as humans. All of the burrs are hanging facing downward. And so I think of this as, you know, I just would like this plant to go to hell. And I hope I'm not offending anybody, but that's, I have these little weird things in my brain that help me remember plants. And so as you can see, these are all hanging downward. Versus our native enchanters nightshade, if you look at the stem, they're spiraled all the way around. If you get these little burrs on your clothing, you can simply just gently brush and they'll fall away. However, if you get these burrs, uh, especially on your wool socks, your polar fleece, you're just going to want to throw your, your item away. They're really nasty. So uh, left side is the good one. Right side, you may not want to have that in your, uh, your woodland. I pull them up and bag them because I don't want that seed to spread. Wild geranium. This is starting to bloom at this time. My woods will just be full of this color uh, shortly. It, it's really an, a beautiful little flower. And here again, the leaves can form, as I'm showing on the right side of the screen, can form a fairly dense cover that's uh, preventing that soil from showing and being extremely accessible to the invasive seeds. Like this one too. Um, moving along, wild ginger. Um, a lot of folks have this occurring naturally. I don't. So it's one of the few plants that I've had to put into my woodland. This started with just a few plants and it's spreading very nicely. It loves deep shade. It will not tolerate much sun at all. I tried it in an area of my um, garden that I thought, well, it's pretty shady here, but it started to die. So what plants were remaining, I had to dig up and move so that they wouldn't completely disappear. And the little flower on this is, uh, whoops, let me back that up here. There's a little flower on the photo that just popped up. And you will be able to, if you watch that closely, you'll be able to see ants and other things pollinating coming in and out of here. So it, it's hard to see unless you really look for it. In the big photo at the right, if you can see my cursor, uh, that's where one of those little seed pods is. In this photo, I lifted the leaves back to get a better view and a picture of that item. Jack in the Pope. A couple questions for you quick. Yes, sure. Um, are there plants that are being recommended all for all Minnesota zones? Are they all hardy to like zone three? The plants that I'm putting in here to the best of my knowledge should be hardy throughout Minnesota. Now, sure. but with that, I will give you that I, I don't know the Lake of the Woods area, some of those way, way northern areas, I, I can't positively say, but to the best of my knowledge, these plants are going to work throughout the majority, if not all of Minnesota. Perfect. Um, Angie has a question about what was the spotted leaf plant on the previous slide? I think it was a couple slides back. Oh, okay, let me see if I can get back there. That's Virginia water leaf. That was, I think, way at the beginning. Sorry, as I'm racing through here. Okay. Yeah, that looks like it. Perfect. It's a Virginia water leaf. Uh, this is very common in our woodlands. I mean, I, I'm near Northfield, Minnesota and southeastern Minnesota, but I certainly would be happy to share plants with some folks. Uh, I mean, I think I can, I don't have to worry about uh, any extinction of species because 
there's plenty of this to go around. So, you know, maybe if, if I get to the point where I feel like uh, I'm getting wiped out, I'll, I'll put a stop to it. But if there's any folks that are down in the Northfield area are going to come down this way, just email me and um, we can make arrangements for that because I really do like this plant. And, and these are naturally occurring in my woodland. They're not things that I planted. The only thing I planted in my woodland was that wild ginger. Any other plants right now? Or plants. <laughs> the, any other questions, Courtney? Yep, um, there's a question. She was actually asking on the slide with the wild geranium or the ginger. She said that there was a spotted leaf. Oh, okay. Let me go over there and see if uh, I can figure this out. Yeah. Okay, this is the wild geranium. Oh, I think the it's spotted one of them leaf. In the top corner. Okay, I'm thinking it might be the the trout lily, which I'm coming to. Perfect. Uh, then I'll, let, yep. I'll let you get to that. There's one other question about okay. the um, the ginger spreading, and is there anything you can do to contain the spreading of the the wild ginger? Well, yeah, dig it up and give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. I I mean, in my woodland, it's not an issue, but I think that it, and again, I I don't have extensive experience with wild ginger. I love it. And if you have a smaller yard, I can understand why that might become a problem. But I think digging, when I've transplanted it, it digs up and it certainly doesn't come back in the areas where I've dug it up. So that's about all I know on that issue. We you know, might have to do some research uh, if, if you were to use the Latin name for sure and do a Google or some sort of internet search on control of and then list your plant in there, that's another good way to find out information. Um, and typically, I, I often do that if I'm looking at control options and see if things have changed. But I'm usually doing it for invasive plants, not native plants. Great. I have and one. Maybe, now, of course, the, the questions are coming. So maybe I will hold off here and let you get back at it and then we'll come back. Okay, and please interrupt me again if, you, uh, if you've if you got something that needs to be addressed if I forget to ask you, Courtney. Oh, okay, wait, I'm gonna add two more that seem really pertinent right now. Okay. Uh, Victoria wants to know how many hours of sun defines shade and what about north versus south facing are the two questions that, are, that have just popped up that seem pertinent. Ooh, okay, That's, that is a really good question. So what defines shade is pretty loosely translated. So the things that I'm covering today are gonna to be found in a mature woodland with a pretty substantial overstory of large trees. However, what I would refer you to, um, and we did a lot of talking about this last time, I use prairiemoon.com in Winona. So prairiemoon.com is their website. Uh, it's Prairie Moon Nursery in Winona. They supply really good quality native plants. And if you go to that website and you enter the plant, or let's just say that you're you're gonna click on the Shady Plants link, they will give you a descriptive box to go with that particular plant. And it will give you the range of sunlight uh, as far as, you know, is it medium shade, deep shade, light shade, better in sun. It will also tell you the soil type where that plant will thrive. So maybe you have only wet soil, you have clay, you have whatever you have, it's also gonna give you the soil type to make sure that you are planting in the best possible habitat for that plant to succeed. Does that answer the question, Courtney? Yeah, and then there was a question about north versus south facing. You know, I think it depends on uh, north is certainly going to get less intense sun than south, but it really is a matter of, I, I don't know what else you have there. It's, it's hard for me to say because is it the edge of the woodland? Is it the middle? Um, you kind of have to be in that area and notice at different times throughout the day, how much sun do you think you're seeing in there in terms of the hours of sun? And that might help isolate what's going to work well. I would say if you have a northern exposure and you're in a woodland, you probably have fairly substantial shade and you want to lean more towards only shade plants. Or if you have something that's marginal, then put it at the fringe of the woodland so that it gets some light. 
we okay to keep moving or should we keep talking yeah, on keep questions? Going. Okay. Okay, Jack in the pulpit, another one that can spread um, pretty quickly. This is not in my yard. And the only reason I know that is because we're gonna talk about this down the road, but there is some garlic mustard here, rosettes. That's horrible. Um, but anyway, Jack in the pulpit spreads really easily. These plants that are showing in the picture maybe are first year plants because I don't see any sign of Jack, which is where the seed comes from. So here's a here's a view of uh, the pulpit, Jack in the pulpit. Um, he's gonna be underneath the leaves. And then as, as um, fall approaches, that little, area will turn into multiple berries that go from green to a deep red. So when I find this in my woodland in the fall, I grab that cluster of berries and I just spread it around to places where there's not a very dense plant cover. You want to probably make sure you wash your hands or you have gloves on because I am fairly certain that um, these are, are not good to digest in your system. That will make you sick. I can also tell you that deer don't eat these typically. And if you've ever considered having goats in your in your woodland for uh, invasives control or buckthorn, what have you, uh, goats don't eat jack in the pulpit for what that's worth. Okay, now I'm gonna move to just a brief little category on spring ephemerals. Uh, they are, as the name infers, ephemerals are fleeting. They're just around for a short time, but some of them uh, will have ground cover that that stays in place for a long time. Not all of them, but some. So here's a trillium. There's nodding trillium. There's multiple. There are multiple species of trillium. Uh, nodding trillium. The flower would actually occur under the leaves. Toothwort is going to be another good ground cover once it gets established. Another spring ephemeral. The uh, the leaves look like this, um, and they will again spread into patches uh, to fill in some of that bare soil. Blood roots. So the blood root, the leaf photo on the left is what I took in the yard uh, at, after the flowers were done blooming. So the leaves are growing bigger and bigger. They're using that leaf size to gather energy from the sun and then store that into their root structure so that they've got the energy they need next year to start flowering again. The flower at the right is not fully open. Um, they will fully open, especially in the sun. If it's a shady day, they don't typically open fully, but when the sun's shining, they open up. And of course, the thing with spring ephemerals is even if you have a shady woodland, these plants are coming up before the trees leaf out. So they do fine, even though you have shade. And then uh, as the leaves on the trees start to fill in and the shade starts to become more dense, they're done flowering and they're just gonna kind of hang out there. Trout lily, this is the one that somebody asked about in the speckled leaves. There are several varieties of trout lily. This is not the endangered trout lily. The endangered trout lily is typically found along the Cannon and Strait River in three counties in Minnesota. It would be, I believe, Rice County, which is my county, Goodhue County, and Steele County, I believe are the ones. Uh, the endangered dwarf trolley, trout lily in the entire planet Earth is only endemic to those three counties along the river. So that's pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of the places, we're seeing garlic mustard invade, and eventually we run the risk of completely losing those species. So all trout lilies will have a leaf with the speckles or the spots, because if you've ever seen a trout, uh, trout have this kind of color configuration and thus the common name trout lily. In our woodland in the spring, and it's now starting to disappear, but we, there's a 40 acre woods that I own with my siblings and it's literally wall to wall carpeted with trout lilies. I can look from one end to the other and it is a solid mass, but they'll go away shortly. They're already disappearing and you would never know that they ever existed if you weren't there at the time that they were out and blooming. Okay, this is Dutchman's breeches. Again, these patches will start to spread throughout the woodland. Uh, the flowers are adorable. They look like little pantaloons hanging upside down on a clothesline, thus the common name Dutchman's breeches. 
Very cute little flower. I love the uh, airy looking leaves. And the patches that I have are growing to be maybe four to five feet in diameter roughly. And they continue to sell, they seed themselves and spread out. Okay, we're, we're gonna take a break from plants for just a little bit and, and go to some more practical manners, which uh, matters, which would be woodland paths and trails. I find that it's really important to have some sort of a way to get into your woods. If you have nothing but solid buckthorn, or maybe it's not even buckthorn, it's just, it's just solid mass, it's really difficult to get through and enjoy your woodland. It's also difficult to be able to access uh, what new plants are coming in or to do buckthorn control. So I think it's important to think about how you can make a path through your woodland for your enjoyment as well as for practical matters like doing um, control of, of nasty plants. Yeah, especially the invasives like garlic mustard. Somehow these plants seem to go into those hidden corners. And I find that having access to get a pretty good view of the woodland is, is really important. I do like this particular trail system. It's not in my woods. I, I hope to use it someday, but I really like this, especially for wet areas so that you're not walking through uh, muck and, um, the other thing to keep in mind is if you are in places where you've been exposed, your shoes have been exposed to invasive seeds that are hanging out in the soil, they're going to get in the bottom of your hiking boots and so forth, and then you're going to transfer them from one location to another. That's how this stuff spreads by and large. And so having something like this in, a, in an area that tends to be wet is going to keep you out of the mud and, and keep you from spreading the nasty stuff around. This is a... This is in our family woodland. Um, minimizing equipment ruts uh, is another issue to think about. We have a little gator or tractor that we take through the woodland. And as part of um, having the DNR private forester come through and take a look at our woods, he suggested that we use younger, maybe two to three inch diameter ironwood, which we have an excess of. It's too, there's too much ironwood. And uh, ironwood is really dense wood. It lasts a long time. And so I created some strips uh, with this uh, ironwood laying across. And since this photo was taken, I also planted eco grass, which they recommended. And then that grass seeds in there and kind of holds everything in place. Prior to having done this, the ruts were easily six to eight inches deep. And it was very hard to access, created a big mess. And um, now I'm much happier with that. Another thing to think about is if you have downed logs, or let's say you're you're cutting buckthorn, some of the larger logs are awesome to delineate a trail or a footpath. Um, it just it kind of gives you that aesthetic. It's a way to reuse the the uh, the nasty brush and logs that are laying around. I would say don't hesitate to take some of it out if you feel like you need to clean things up a bit. But certainly I like to use it for my trail system. I also use uh, brush, which can start to create a trail system or be part of it. This happens to be a pile of buckthorn brush from the back area. You can see the mature trees in the back. Well, in front of that was solid buckthorn. So I, I've been working on that in this particular slope. It is, it is a fairly steep slope. It's not so easy to tell in this picture. So the buckthorn is serving a couple purposes. I first laid the berry laden branches at the bottom. I piled more brush on top of that. Now the buckthorn berries are falling to the bottom. They're not getting any sunlight and they probably will have very low to no germination once they fall into the soil. The native plants don't mind the stuff at all. As you can see, they're starting to grow right through that brush pile. They like that cover. So that's another good use for your brush and your logs. This kind of looks a bit on the ugly side, but again, if I'm taking out buckthorn in my woodland or a, a client's woodland, I'm going to pile the berries down first, then I'm going to put some more brush on top to cover up those berries. And what starts to happen is I'm creating wildlife habitat. So there might be things like ground nesting birds. The American woodcock is a ground nesting bird that can make a home in this. And certainly toads and other amphibians, salamanders and small mammals, they're gonna find a home in this. And the other good thing is it's 
covering the soil. So maybe where that buckthorn had been growing, because of its dense shade, there was a lot of exposed soil. By piling all this brush around the drip line of those buckthorn trees, I am now starting to mimic that native or that organic duff layer that should be there. Leaves will start to collect. And uh, after this photo was taken, if I had gone back out to take another picture, I'd see all kinds of native plants coming through that. For those of you that are doing uh, buckthorn control or have some downed wood or need to thin trees, if you have access to your woodland, mulch, mulch, mulch. You can see some of the mulch that was blown back in there. Those are native. Um, I think we've got some choke cherries in there, possibly an elm, American elm. But you can't, you just can't go wrong by mulching into your woodland. Same thing would go for leaves. I see so many, especially in the suburban, urban areas, I see so many bags of leaves that have been raked up waiting for someone to come and take them to the compost, the garbage dump, or wherever it is they go. And I just want to go knock on the door and say, please, people, you've got gold in those bags. Go put it in your woods. Go to where the exposed soil is. Go to where your native plants are and keep that stuff in the woodland. It's not serving anything by sending it away. Or if you happen to notice that your neighbors are doing that, um, you might say, hey, do you mind if I take those and empty those bags uh, of leaves into my woodland? And oh, by the way, you can have those black plastic garbage bags back and use them again. So here's an example of what I mean by exposed soil. And then after this, Courtney, I'm gonna take a break and take questions. Um, this is uh, adjacent to a customer, uh, one of my customer's properties. This was in Plymouth, Minnesota. That, um, stand of trees that you see is what's left after they did a clear cut of buckthorn. So basically they went in and they yanked everything out, all the buckthorn, all at one time. And I never advise that for a couple of reasons. First of all, if we get a big rain event, like we're now having that 100 year rain occurring at least once every summer, at least where I live, the erosion potential for all of that exposed soil is tremendous that soil is gonna wash down into that little creek at the base and it's gonna mess up our water supply. We don't want that. Even worse than that, this is my last slide, then I'll take a break. Even worse than that, what showed up in there the next year was a massive infestation of garlic mustard. I have said to many people, I'll take a hundred acres of buckthorn over one acre of garlic mustard. This is a nasty, nasty plant. We know that plants that are growing in the perfect location in a sunny area can easily have 8,000 seeds, one plant, 8,000 seeds. We also know that those plants can survive in the seed bank for at least 12 years. So you can imagine every time you dig up something, every time you pull a buckthorn out, every time we have a big rain event and there's erosion, all those seeds that have been dropping are churning. So buckthorn needs to come out slowly, just like it appeared, or you're gonna end up with a bigger problem. And I'll talk more about that later in the presentation. So for now, I'm gonna stop. And Courtney, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, um, speaking of buckthorn, Susan wants to know if there is an easy way to ID buckthorn, um, something about orange bark maybe, any thoughts? Yes, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, I have worked with some of the school districts to teach their kids. Uh, I've worked with third graders and fifth graders, and I spend an hour with them, 30 kids to a class, and the next day they go out and they tell the chaperones what the buckthorn looks like and, and where to find it so that they can cut it and, and treat the stems. So it's very easy for me to teach folks. Uh, the problem with cutting into the bark, that orange bark, well, a cherry tree looks a lot like buckthorn a black cherry tree. You cut that out and you see orange bark, it's a little bit late. So I'd rather that people weren't messing up the bark potentially on a black cherry. So we can ID by the bud in winter. We can ID by the leaf this time of year. And at the, uh, almost towards the very end, I'm gonna uh, give you some links to our website where you can, um, you can take a look at our tutorial on the website and you will have, really good use um, of free resources to learn how to ID buckthorn. And this is, this is what I get 
all jazzed about is teaching people about buckthorn and garlic mustard. So if you're not finding what you need, um, I can help you. But but there will be some resources almost towards the end of the presentation if you can hang on just a bit. Thanks, Cheryl. A um, couple more questions. Okay. Going back to the wild ginger, um, if you put the that black edging, to, would that help spread the um, wild ginger from spreading? Well, my my guess, and this is purely a guess, I'm I'm fairly certain it would. I I am so lazy, I don't put any any edging in my woods. <laughs> I just I let it go. But again, I have a lot of space. If I if I had a a little bit of a smaller shady urban yard, and it was a concern because it was taking over, absolutely, I think you could do that. Um, Sounds good. I certainly would try that. Awesome. Um, the pictures with the pine needles in the ground, is that naturally from your trees in your yard did you, or did you bring those in? I have never brought pine needles in, so they're naturally occurring. My wild ginger patch that I transplanted, I stuck underneath some pine trees because it was the closest place that I had. So it's not even, it's not even in my main woodland. I just, it's like, oh my gosh, these plants are dying. I went to the closest place I could find dug them up, jammed them in the ground, and that's where they're growing. And I haven't taken the time to put them in the main woodland as yet. Sounds good. Is there is mulching okay on steeper woodland hills by a creek or does it promote erosion? Mulching does not promote erosion, to the contrary. But here's what I would say. If you have a creek at the base and you are putting in uh, mulch or leaves and um, you don't have anything natural there to stop the runoff, there's a couple things I would do. If you recall, we talked about those big logs earlier. Well, I would probably lay some of those big logs sporadically perpendicular to my slope. So if you think about, gee, if I poured a bucket of water, where would it run? I want the log to be blocking that. So the more times I do that throughout my slope, the more times the water has to slow down and it can soak into the soil. The other good thing is if you do have things like a garlic mustard seed bank or some nasty stuff, the um, these logs and brush piles that you've placed are going to trap a good majority of that nasty seed. So now instead of having an entire slope full of this stuff, it's gonna start to catch in those places. And so control is gonna work a lot better when it's isolated into those spots. The other thing that we've done where we don't we don't have logs and we don't have trees to put logs behind. We'll take um, maybe like roughly half inch stems of, of buckthorn. I'll cut with my pruners, I'll cut the bottom at a, a sharp angle. I'll cut the top flat and then we'll pound a few of those in and use that to hold our brush in place on the slope so that it won't keep washing down. So that's another option. We also use trees. We put uh, shrubs or excuse me, brush at the backside of trees. if if the slope is downhill and use that sort of stuff to hold the mulch in place or the leaves or what have you. Excellent. Um, there's one more question about the buckthorn, the buckthorn seeds on the cut brush under the brush pile. Um, would, can they work into the, can the seeds from those buckthorn work into the soil and get underneath and germinate? Well, they certainly can. And here's why I put those, uh, I pile brush on top of that because when those seeds eventually dry up and fall off. Yes, they're gonna go into the soil. But because I've piled brush on top of brush and now I got native plants growing in there, the sun doesn't have access to that, that seed bank in that area. And um, the experts estimate that buckthorn seeds are viable for five to seven years. So there's not a really good way for the sun to get at them. And it's very likely that well, for sure, the majority won't germinate. There might be a couple. But I have an area in our 40-acre woods that is where we first started doing our buckthorn work. And I'm talking like the massive, huge, old-growth buckthorn that had so many berries. The area was huge. And we just piled them because there was no way to get a mulcher in there. They just had to stay there. And I don't think I'm exaggerating to say there could be a million seeds in that area. And I believe, um, I think I'm either going on year seven or year eight. And I think I've only had to go in and cut out 
10 buckthorn that have germinated from that pile. So I cut them and stem treat them with herbicide and that's it. And I did that on my own property. And I've done this, I've done this so many times. It's just, what, to me, what's worse is when people say, well, you gotta get those berries out of there. And buckthorn tends to grow pretty willy nilly. So if I'm trying to haul that buckthorn brush with berries, I'm smacking into this tree, smacking into that tree, and I'm leaving a trail of berries throughout the woodland. That to me is a whole lot worse because now I've potentially started infestations all over the place. I also don't like burning the wood because that buckthorn wood is going to rot and decompose and it's going to um, provide nutrients back into the soil again. Um, so that's how I work it and I've had very good success with it. Excellent. I have uh, similar questions for both Brian and Angie about what's the best way to control garlic mustard? Or to we're going to get to we're going to get to that at the end. Okay. All buckthorn and garlic mustard questions we're going to address at the end. We might have to have a whole seminar just on that. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have um, I'm gonna pause with the rest of the questions and let you keep going, and we'll come back to them. All right. Here we go. One thing that, so there's going to be a resource on our website that you can look up for, for garlic mustard. And one thing that's changed since I uh, published that, not much has changed, but what I'm starting to tell people is if you've got a significant infestation and you can't get to it, I'm perfectly fine with you using a weed whip. I would prefer you did it before those salix, those little seed pods get to be very mature. But um, the other thing you can do is you could put a tarp over it. I know of people that have put um, a big tarp over an area like this, a plastic tarp. It basically rots and turns to mush. So that prevents it. Um, I know people that use goats. They have it, The garlic mustard needs to be at this stage roughly because if it's uh, dried out, they don't want to eat it. The thing about goats is they're very expensive. Somehow people think that they're cheap, but they're not. There's a lot of transportation issue. There's fencing issues if you're going to rent them. So unless you own them, uh, it's not very, it's not a very cheap way to go. As far as disposal, it's illegal for us to put greens into our garbage. So what I recommend to people is start an area where you're disposing of your nasties, uh, your, your compost pile for nasties. It is a compost pile that you will never use in your garden or anywhere else, but you just start it in an area where it's not very nice anyway. You may want to lay a tarp or cardboard below it. That's up to you. But the critical thing is tarp over the top of that pile and then secure it very well so that those seeds aren't rolling around and, and getting other places. Okay, now we're going to move on to accessorizing with nature. At the, at the left uh, is a tree that was in my woodland. It needed to come down because I think it was box elder and I had too many other high value species. So I was, I was minimizing the number of box elder trees. This particular one had a double stump, so it turned into a chair. I've got the, the seat of the chair and then the back of the chair. So kind of some fun things that you can do. The photo on the right side is an old stump that is fully rotted out from top to bottom. And it actually even has, you can see one of them towards the bottom, a little area that's uh, rotted out where there used to be a limb. And so it's kind of fun for me to put plants in here. They can be plants that I'm gonna put in my, my yard, in my formal area, or I can throw stuff in there in the woodland. Just a little bit of whimsy if you want something like that. Also, sometimes things need to be caged because of deer. And if you can see behind that dead stump, this is, um, I believe it's called concrete mesh. It's roughly, I'm thinking five by five squares. I bought a big roll at Menards and it, it does turn rusty colored. But what I'm finding is instead of these unsightly ugly fences, if we have to uh, put some, some protection around trees, et cetera, till they get big enough to not be harmed by deer brows, this works really well. And I might put in like a three eighths inch uh, uh, rebar um, into the soil and that holds it in place. Then I can either overlap the ends of the wire or I can put a zip tie on. What I like about this wire is that it's sturdy enough to move and reuse versus chicken wire and some of the other uh, options are not gonna be that sturdy. Okay, I guess I'm moving along here. This uh, little trellis I made out of theater branches that I had to trim because they were in my way when I mowed. I accidentally busted off, uh, I think I drove the tractor over this thing and so a couple on the top left busted off, but just an idea of sometimes you can, you know, buckthorn would be perfect for this too, to start to get creative and use it to your advantage. 
uh, oh, these are some of the ironwoods that I cut down in my woods that were shading out burr oaks and other higher value species. So um, we just put some stakes in here and this was my compost pile that was pretty substantial. And now I've got my potatoes growing in there this year. And so I, I think they're gonna be pretty happy there. So that's another use for some of this brush that you might have laying around or logs. Here's a little planter that a friend gave my daughter. It's just hollowed out right here. And uh, we put this at the edge of our vegetable garden and grow herbs in there, but you could stick that in your woodland or anywhere. If you wanna get really creative, this was when I lived in Minnetonka. Um, I took an old shed that we really didn't need. I put a raised floor in it and converted it into a chicken coop. So um, we could let the chickens graze around. Neighbors loved it. They brought food. My little uh, nesting boxes were right here so that I could just open the box from outside. Chickens laid their eggs in there. They had little trap doors that went outside and they could graze around in the yard and uh, eat bugs and nasty weeds. Okay, next we're gonna move on to woody plants. This is gonna be pretty short. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time here. Looks like I need to start moving along. The, um, I don't believe that I remembered to put this in that resource document that was uh, available, but um, my by far my favorite book is uh, for Woodland ID plants and knowing what should go where is Trees and Shrubs of Minnesota. It's written by Welby Smith. He is an employee of the Minnesota DNR. He's our state botanist in Minnesota. And um, in this book, you will find, this is an example of a, a Pagoda Dogwood page. And by the way, all the dogwoods that are native to Minnesota are excellent choices for shady areas. So what he does is he goes through and he describes what it is. How do you ID it? It's natural history. And then if you'll see, there's a little map inset and it shows the counties. The counties in which this is uh, historically occurring are shown in the darker brown. And so, you know, in the metro, we're roughly this area. And so then you you know, oh yeah, well that that would work in my area. That that does belong in my area. And the opposing page then has photos of what does the leaf look like, flower, the stem, the growth pattern. So between the the uh, verbal description and then the photos and the location of where this plant is found, I really, really like this book. He, he has native plants and he's got non-native plants in there. So it'd be shrubs and trees both included. It's a pretty thick book. I think uh, they sell new for around 60 bucks, but um, well worth the money. So also referencing another author, uh, Douglas Tallamy. I don't know if many of you have heard of him. Uh, I think I referenced him early on. His Bringing Nature Home book, I just fell in love with. He, he looks at how native plants take care of our, our native species. And to do that, he uses Lepidoptera species. So Lepidoptera are uh, butterflies and moths. And he, in one section of the book, talks about various trees, woody plants, and he, he explains how many species they support as compared to a non-native tree, like a, a ginkgo tree. And black cherry and choke cherry, which do well in a shady woodland, rank third in the number of Lepidoptera species that he found them to support. 456 species, and that's just Lepidoptera. We're not talking birds or mammals that eat acorns, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty impressive how many species the um, black cherries, choke cherries, et cetera, will support. The, this is actually a black cherry. This is the bark. It looks like flaking potato chips can be very much confused with mature buckthorn. Um, choke cherry is gonna look very similar. The difference is the uh, black cherry has this rusty colored fuzz on the bottom of the leaf, right along that main vein, the stem. If you find that, that is a positive ID for black cherry. No other species has that. Choke cherry will have a very similar shaped leaf, but it'll be more, uh, it'll be wider, wider oval, not quite as long and narrow. Flowers will be the same. Uh, bark will be smoother on a choke cherry, but you'll also be able to find these in Welby Smith's book if you can get that or get it from the library when COVID-19 is over. Some of the things that he said were you know, the berries. Um, these are in addition to, you know, we can eat them. Um, these berries from black cherry and choke cherry are gonna feed a number of our birds. 
they're going to feed uh, native bee species, and they're going to be hosts for some of those beautiful butterflies. Elderberry is another one I like. There are two species both occurring here. One will be blooming shortly now, the red-berried uh, elderberry. Red-berried, obviously, it's going to have bright red, tiny berries. And then later in the summer, we're going to have the American elderberry, which has the black berries. I know you can eat one of these. I don't remember what you have to do. I've never made elderberry jam, but that's certainly an option. But the birds love them. Um, this is an example of the leaf set that you would be looking for. Okay, a few ferns, just a quick, quick on the ferns here. I know that this is lady fern because what I was taught was the lady forgot to shave her legs. So if you look at this stubble, you'll know, okay, that's a lady fern. Um, in this case, on this side, there's no stubble. This is an ostrich fern. It's got some of these little brownish paper-like um, I can't remember their technical name, but they will occur there. And as well, ostrich fern has this deep channel if you look closely at the stalk. So it's just quick on the ferns. There's a lot of native ferns in Minnesota. Maiden hair is another one that's quite beautiful. Wild columbine, very pretty. It's not going to grow in a shady area. It's not going to be prolific, but it sure does add that little zip of color mixed in with some of the other uh, background plants. Uh, this is the only plant that I don't actually have growing in my woods of all the ones that I've uh, put forth here, but I have seen it growing in parks and other areas. Uh, I think it's quite pretty. Um, the very delicate blue flower. The other one that I don't have that I think is another good choice is woodland phlox, native woodland phlox. And if I decide to add those, if they don't start to show up on their own, I would probably go to Prairie Moon Nursery and, um, and order it from, from their stock of plants. Uh, all of the photos in here are our own, but here I've referenced, this one is from Eloise Butler, Friends of the Wildflower Garden. I have a link to them in the resource document because they have great information about plants, descriptions, control methods, et cetera. Okay, quickly on poison ivy, just to, so that you have some comfort. This is poison ivy. This picture was taken maybe a week ago. And the best thing that I can point out is where the red arrow is. There are the three leaves. So if you've heard the acronym, leaves of three, flee from thee. There are going to be these uh, two opposing leaves opposite each other. But then the front leaf is more pronounced. And it has a longer stem here. And that's kind of what you want to look for. They are a woody species. If you look closely at the stem, it's actually wood. It's not a forb. So three leaves and then this front one jets out a bit. And just for comparison, I put in here a trillium. So trillium is radially symmetrical, or in other words, there's a common axis. All the leaves are equally located at that stem, whereas this one is not equal. This one sticks out farther. So keep an eye out for poison ivy if you might have uh, an allergic condition. Okay, this is just a quick commercial for, for my company, Landscape Restoration. These are used for buckthorn control or basically anything with a stem. Um, they do not come with herbicide. EPA only allows the manufacturer to bottle it. We sell two variations. There's this one with two tips and a removal tool. This removal tool helps pop off the um, applicator, the foam applicator tip, if you need to replace it because it wears out or if you need to restock with herbicide. Uh, we also provide extra replacement caps if you lose them, extra tips. And I always use market blue dye or some sort of dye uh, when I'm using my herbicide. And the purpose is, as you can see here, this is a buckthorn stump with a quarter there. So it's probably 14 inches in diameter. Helps me see where I'm treating. You only need to herbicide tr treat on the very outer perimeter when you're doing cut stump treatment. And also somebody asked about, um, Buckthorn ID, in addition to having plenty of free resources on our website, our uh, plant um, field ID guide goes through all the options we can think of for controlling buckthorn and then lists about uh, 20 some, I think it's 19 maybe species that are native that are perfect replacement plants or found in the same area as buckthorn. And then we list three non-natives to look out for. There's a picture of the leaf, the bud, the berry, uh, the flower and oftentimes the trunk, which will help with ID in any season. Another commercial for Douglas Tallamy, uh, we do stock these two books of his. 
Bringing Nature Home came out a while ago that I really love. Nature's Best Hope, as you can see from the title, is on the New York Times bestseller. He is an amazing author, and what I really like about him are the things that he recommends are not a big deal for any of us to do. He makes it very easy to create pollinator habitat in our properties and collaborate with our neighbors when possible. And uh, there's an event coming up October 2nd and 3rd. There's a link in the um, resource document. Uh, the event is called the Minnesota Woodland Owners Weekend, uh, or MinWOW for short. Douglas Tallamy will be speaking that Saturday morning, October 3rd at nine o'clock. He will also be available for book signings and there will be books for purchase if you can make it there. Uh, Dr. Lee Fralick from the University of Minnesota Extension will be speaking on Friday evening, the night before. So they're two heavy hitter uh, nationally known speakers. And if, if you wanna find um, an event that's gonna help you as a woodland owner, you uh, don't need to have a huge acreage. If you've got half an acre and you wanna know what to do, I think you'll find that the speaker lineup is awesome. And the link that I put into the resource document may not be effective for a couple more days. We're just fine tuning this whole process. So if you have questions, ask me. If you wanna buy the books from me or through our website, get in touch with me. And if you mentioned that you were part of the webinar, we'll give you a 20% discount. So all of this stuff is available at that link at the bottom of the page and in the resource document. So we're wrapping things up here. Um, what I wanna just say about um, buckthorn and garlic mustard is if you go to our website and you click on the homepage, I've listed out on the left side, the tabs that you'll find on the homepage. I've highlighted in yellow buckthorn and then the invasive species tab for more information. If you click on invasive species, there's a drop down, and then click on garlic mustard. Well, it looks like products shouldn't be in that line. It should have been in the next line. But anyway, if you read those articles, the buckthorn one is gonna help you with buckthorn identification and control methods. The invasive species tab that drops down to garlic mustard is gonna do the same thing. It's gonna compare plants that are frequently confused with garlic mustard. The thing you need to know is if you're looking to have a native woodland and you wanna be part of this big movement to help our environment, you have to control your invasive species or they're going to start to take over and you're not going to have a very successful project, if at all. Um, but I feel like the methodology that we use is designed to allow you to put in the least amount of effort with whether it's time resource or dollar resource and get to restoration of the native habitat faster. Uh, this, this stuff didn't come in overnight and it's certainly not gonna leave overnight. And people that do clear cuts and wipe stuff out really fast, usually when it comes to buckthorn, I'm speaking, uh, are gonna end up with a bigger problem with the garlic mustard. So right now, this is what the garlic mustard is looking like. It's a bi biennial, this is year two of the plant. It's starting to form these seed pods called salix. They look like tiny green beans. They will continue to grow, get fatter, dry out, and then they'll burst and the seed will spread in about a nine foot radius from the plant. They're really easy to pull up at this point. If you have, you know, if you wanna pull them up, go ahead, realize you're disturbing the soil when you pull. And so maybe throw in some native seed or make sure you get some leaf litter or mulch or something to cover that area so that you're not uh, creating a bigger problem than you already have. The first year plants right now look like that smaller inset that just popped up. That means that that just germinated this spring. And then next year, it's gonna bolt like the bigger photo and it's gonna disperse seed. This is what happens with buckthorn when you don't put ground cover down. Um, you, these are all individual little germinating buckthorn that are probably somewhere between you know, half an inch to two inches tall. Again, another reason why it's so important to put uh, leaf litter and brush down on those bare spots so that this stuff struggles to germinate and we don't give it such a, a head start. Okay, I feel like I'm at the end of my time. Let me just do a quick time check. Yes, I'm actually past time. So I'm available to stay on as long as need be to take all the questions. Perfect. Um, thank you, Cheryl. And thanks for everyone for attending. We'll get to those questions in just a second. Um, in case you need to leave early, I just wanted to let you know that um, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 
uh, 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. Um, and on behalf of the Minnesota State Horticultural Society and our presenter, I just wanted to thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Um, now to just jump back to a bunch of those questions. Um, Carol would like to know, if, is it possible to get rid of the earthworms? No, <laughs> that's a great question. And no, I mean, they, we haven't at this point, those people that study this type of thing um, say no. So the best thing you can do is uh, if you go fishing or, you know, dispose of your bait properly. That's how this all started. So just keep in mind to properly dispose of things that are invasive species, and that includes earthworms. Sounds good. Sarah would like to know what else won't goats eat? The only thing that I know of is Jack in the pulpit. They love fruit trees, and that would include cherries, apples, dogwoods. Um, so if you're going to have goats, you're going to need to either use some of that hardware cloth that I showed, that cement. Um, hardware cloth to protect your high value stuff or or you know fence them out of areas where you have some higher value things goats eat everything and it's good and bad that means that they eat a lot of the stuff that sheep and set and such won't eat but it's also bad if you want to try to protect your natives dennis or denise has a question about any suggestions for getting rid of vinca or lily of the valley oh my gosh lily of the valley is a tough one because it has corms or little bulbs under the soil. And the best thing you could do is just don't plant it. Um, that might be one where you wanna take its uh, Latin name and go online and research control options. Um, you know, other than digging it up, the problem with even using an herbicide, of course, we don't like to use those unless we have no other option, but you can top kill but you're not gonna kill that corm in the soil. Siberian squill is another one that's extremely problematic for the same reason. So you might have success if it's a limited area or patches where you can put down some cardboard and then you know put rocks or leaves and mulch over the top of it or a tarp temporarily, uh, but that's a tough one. Without digging it out, it's gonna be tough to get rid of it. Mark has the question about, do you have any plant suggestions for a rain garden in, in a heavily shaded area? We're going to talk about rain gardens and prairies a week from today on the next webinar. But uh, in heavily shaded areas, I would certainly try to put in the um, jewel weed, that spot of touch me not that we showed earlier. Um, and off the top of my head, I'm drawing a blank, but I will try to have you can either email and ask me, remind me, uh, my contact information is on the screen, or show up next week and hopefully I'll address that. I will put down a note to myself to make sure to try to include shade plants for wet areas as well, if there are any. And there are, I just can't think of them off the top of my head. No problem. Bobby has a question about um, oak, oak leaves from the oak trees that they have. And if they can leave those fallen leaves in their perennial beds, or should they need, or should they rake them out in the spring? Okay, if you're doing a perennial bed, I, I'm questioning is it, is it, uh, you know, a formal garden where maybe you have some things in there that are cultivars, or is it, is it a native garden bed? Generally, um, oak leaves are going to be okay, but it depends. I have some grasses, native grasses planted in one of my more more formal areas and those grasses need the, the a little bit more sun and and they can't grow through because they're more of a prairie plant so in those cases i do pull back some of the leaves but i try not to pull back everything and if any of you have heard of heather holm or read her books there's a uh, there's some habitat use for bees and other insects and pollinators in that leaf litter um, so I would say, yeah, it's okay to pull some of it back, but I wouldn't, you know, I've seen people go hog wild with the rake and, and believe me in the past, I've done it myself before I knew better. I wouldn't take everything up. And what you do take up, I'd make sure you throw in the woodland on your bare soil. Excellent. Um, there's a question about, is there a similar book for ground covers as you should recommend for trees and shrubs? I cannot think of anything that is specifically for ground covers. However, 
the advice that I give you that I would follow myself is I would go to uh, Prairie Moon Nursery and I would look up shade plants and ground covers or I would call and talk to the folks there. They're very, very helpful. They are a huge resource. They've been around a long time. Um, and so if you're not finding what you want on the website, don't hesitate to call them and talk to them uh, about your particular site and then just be prepared to give them a description of what you have. Is your soil wet? Is it dry? Is it, is it mesic? Is it in between? Um, maybe some of the types of plants that are growing around, how heavy is the shade? And I think that they're a fabulous resource, but I cannot think of a book that is available for just shady ground cover. Going back to the buckthorn questions, I got a couple of questions for you. Um, have you ever used the baggy method to kill buckthorn stumps? Um, is now a good time to kill to cut buckthorn and paint it with the herbicide and how do you kill buckthorn growing from the stumps okay the baggy question uh i am familiar with the baggy it's come up at some of the conferences i've been to uh somewhere along the line i got a couple for free i've never used them and there's a couple reasons why first of all when we're working in the woodland whether it's mine or, or uh, a client's i do not have time to cut the thing down and put that baggie over it and zip tie it. The other issue is, by the time I covered all the stumps, I would have an issue of litter with that plastic. The other problem that I'm hearing, not that I personally experienced, but I'm hearing from other folks in the industry is, it's very common for the buckthorn to find its way to the sun and start to shoot out beyond that plastic the so i mean that's bad enough you don't want to you don't want it to come back but um then the other thing is we suddenly then have all this plastic litter that starts to decompose and is scattered throughout the woodland so for me in my situation it's not practical if i had two or three buckthorn that i needed to take down and that's all i had in my yard certainly i would i would give it a go um, right now our buckthorn is still leafing out in most areas so if you wanted to do a cut stump herbicide treatment, I would advise that you'd wait a little bit longer if you cut the stalk or the stem and you notice after a few minutes that there's moisture gathering on the cut surface, it is still sending energy upward for plant growth. And we want that to stop. We want it to start gathering energy from the sun in its leaves and transporting that downward into the root structure. And at that time, herbicide treatment would be effective. Um, I'm trying to think, I thought I had another comment on this. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. If you feel like you wanna do something to get rid of buckthorn now, you can already tell which ones are the females. You can see tiny green BB sized little um, shapes that are towards the leaf axles on the branches. Those are gonna be future berries. So maybe you've got some time now before it gets really hot. When I do that type of work, I cut the buckthorn trunk about three feet high I dispose of the brush, put it against my slope, um, but I do not treat with herbicide at that first cutting. So now I have cut it up high enough that I'm not tripping on it. And also as it's gonna re, try to regrow, it's gonna come up towards the top of the stem, the stump uh, that I've left behind like a topiary. So I've got plenty of room to cut down below a second time when the weather is cooler in fall or winter or whenever I get around to it. And at that second cut, I cut close to the soil and then I treat the perimeter with herbicide. So that's what I would recommend if you wanna work on buckthorn now, but just remember the first step in buckthorn removal is taking out only those that are producing berries, or if you see some higher value things like burr oak seedlings, uh, some very nice natives, maybe you do a little extra release in that area. That's all you do and then get the heck out of there and wait until the next season before you do the next pass. Excellent. Sarah has a quick question about, um, she has plastic. How long does she wanna leave that on the stump if she's not gonna use her herbicide? I, you know what, I, I can't answer that because I don't know. I guess I'd call the person that does the buckthorn baggie and see what they recommend. Um, perhaps even go to their web, website and see what they say. Sounds good. And is there any current thinking on using weed wrenches to remove invasives? I love a good weed wrench. <laughs> it's great. You do? <laughs> I do. Oh, golly. Okay. I have a paper. If anybody wants to email me and ask for it about the weed wrench, I'm happy to share it. The weed wrench, in my opinion, 
and this is my opinion because I believe anybody who works to control buckthorn is a hero. But in my opinion, the weed wrench has one purpose and that is scrap metal. And here's why. The weed wrench, uh, you can imagine as it's yanking up that root structure is disturbing a significant amount of soil. What's it doing when it does that? It's pulling up all those berries, the, the seeds that have dispersed from the buckthorn, probably garlic, mustard seed, native, or excuse me, uh, invasive thistles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're bringing that all back to the surface. We have this nice loose soil and that stuff is gonna take over like a flash of lightning going through the woods. So um, some years ago, I talked to somebody from the DNR, their old brochure had the weed wrench in the buckthorn brochure. It no longer does. I said, why do you guys put that in there? That is such a terrible thing to use in a woodland. And she said, some people are just completely opposed to using any herbicide. So we put that in there for them. She goes, if it makes you feel better, make sure you've got some native um, seed on hand and throw it into all that loose soil. And I said, okay, I can live with that. But here's the other problem. Besides all the soil disturbance, if you have a sloped area, you are um, potentially going to have a significant erosion event. I worked at a property on the St. Croix River, very steep bank. And the, the fellow that was the neighbor to this property said, yeah, he said, uh, it's a good thing you're not using that weed wrench. He said, you know, the DNR had some homeowners out here a while back and uh, they were using that weed wrench on the slope. Well, he says, we got a real heavy rain about a week later. And he said, the majority of that slope washed into the St. Croix River. So there you go. That's my take on the weed wrench. It's not efficient either. I mean, you're gonna spend 10 minutes yanking that thing out when you could cut and dab at least 10 plants while you're working on that. But I understand some people like it, especially guys, they seem to enjoy that. You know, it's, it's, it's just uh, who's gonna survive here and somehow men tend to like that more than women, but I, I am opposed to it personally. Yeah, I mostly like it for getting all the like maple seedlings out of my garden beds that won't <laughs> just are proliferate. I think that is the end of our questions. Thank you so much, Cheryl. You're welcome. And if somebody wants to reach me, um, they uh, you're certainly welcome to send me an email. Just put webinar in the subject line or something because if 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 you say something weird, I'm I'm just gonna it's gonna go into my spam and I'm not gonna open it. So say webinar or or just use something that lets me know that you're a real person. And by the way, thank you everybody for listening. If you're still hanging around, my motto is if you listen, I'll keep talking. So with that, Courtney, you better cut me off. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks so much, Cheryl. You're welcome. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, everybody.